a car bombing, your passport getting jacked, and guns being waved in the locker room. What do all three of these scenarios have in common? Well, these are real world examples of what has happened in overseas basketball. Now, in case you guys haven't noticed, global and international affairs are more shaky than ever at the moment. So this leads me to a very relevant question for this week's podcast. Is overseas basketball safe? Now we'll try to peel this back layer by layer to the point where I think hopefully players will have a concrete idea of how they can actually evaluate if a country is safe for them or not. But the first thing you have to understand is that safety is all relative. Safety is a subjective term, meaning based on your upbringing, your background, your thought process, your philosophy of life, safety will mean different to you. So for instance, if a kid was growing up in a very dangerous environment, crime ridden, drug ridden, versus a kid who grows up in a suburban gated community with very little crime, very little malicious or bad things happening within that environment, those two people may have two different perceptions of what is safety. Not necessarily, but it's probably a pretty good chance that they're both gonna have different perceptions of what is safe. And a perfect example of this happened to me personally. When I played in El Salvador, so I played there for about five or six years. At this time, this was when El Salvador was the murder capital of the world. As you can imagine, when I went there, I was terrified. I didn't know what to do. All I heard on the news all the time was people getting murdered, people getting shot, gangs taken over in El Salvador. That's all I ever knew about this country. Now, I grew up poor, but I did not grow up in a dangerous environment. So that is what really terrified me about going to El Salvador. Even though there was some crime in my neighborhood, it was more so that we really struggled financially. When you contrast that to my teammates, some of my teammates, they had grown up in these rough areas in the States. It always amazed me. To them, El Salvador was no different. They would always say this to me, as long as you are respectful, as long as you don't look for trouble, then nothing is really going to happen to you. And they were never really even phased by this whole media watch that was happening on the country regarding how dangerous it was because their perception of what was safe and what was dangerous was different to my perception of what was safe and what was dangerous. So that is the first thing you have to understand when you say, is it safe to play overseas basketball? Is it safe to play in Thailand, China, Japan, Rwanda, Qatar, El Salvador? First, you have to understand where are you coming from when you are asking that question and you have to identify that within yourself. Now, with all of that being said, as long as you exercise basic caution and common sense, you should be fine. Meaning you follow these sacred principles of traveling. And this applies beyond just overseas basketball. Anyone who has traveled, they essentially always follow these basic principles acting respectful to the culture, AKA you're not just being a loud mouth, you're not drawing attention to yourself, you're just minding your own business. Number two, you don't stay out too late at night, nor do you stay out too late at night by yourself. Number three, you don't go to places you shouldn't be in. So you better find out from your organization if there are some bad areas. Number four, don't wear flashy clothes or items. And number five, try to stay in a crowded area with a lot of people so that you're not just by yourself if you are going somewhere. If you follow those principles, does that mean that nothing bad's gonna happen to you? No, but we're just trying to decrease the chances of something bad happening when you're playing. And that brings me to my third point, that players, when you are entering a country, you have to do your due diligence and you have to at least have some sort of background knowledge of what this country is and its history politically. This is why it's so interesting because yes, we are overseas basketball players. All we want to do is hoop. All we want to do is get paid for it, do what we love to do. But you are so much bigger than that. You are so much more than that. I said a tweet something about you think you're a player, but you're not. You're your own promoter, researcher, marketer, uh, social media manager. You're all of these things. And that is the modern age of the overseas basketball player. So this is another way that you have to understand at least some background knowledge of the country that you're going to. So I'm going to hope that the players playing some of these areas that are conflicted with war and violence, that they had some sort of background knowledge heading into it. And they weighed the pros and the cons and they said, hey, I'm still going to go for it.
And that's fine. Everyone obviously can make their own decisions. That's much different than someone just blindly going in and not knowing anything about the background or the history of a country. Because there can be very serious situations that happen. The Israel and Palestine one is one that is probably the most extreme, that you are literally in a war zone. Another example, if you guys Google Marcus Campbell, this guy was a former G Leaguer. He played in Qatar and he essentially was held hostage in Qatar. They took his passport. I believe there was some sort of money dispute over his contract and they didn't want to pay him a certain amount and his agent was trying to negotiate something else. They held it so he couldn't leave Qatar. So these are all extreme but real world scenarios that have happened. So do your research beforehand and make sure you know the history of the country that you're going into. When you are doing your research, usually you have to take what the media says with a grain of salt. Because before I was a professional player, I was actually working in sports media and media in general. So I know exactly how the media machine works. The media machine thrives on clicks and fear. Those are the two driving principles of media. So I'll give an example. If 100 people in your city live peacefully for a month, but one person gets murdered that month, the media won't report on the 100 people that live peacefully for that month. Instead, they will report on the one person who is murdered. Why? One, because it's a murder. And in media, there's an old saying, if it bleeds, it leads, meaning it leads the show, it leads the paper because everyone wants to read about the bad and awful things that are happening because they don't want it to happen to them. They know how the brain works. They know the psychology behind it. But more important than that, media, they report on outliers. They report on things that are out of the norm. So that's why you always see in the media car accidents, killings, homicides, everything that is out of the norm and the exception to the rule is what they report on because ultimately they thrive on you coming back for more. That's why it's good to look at different angles, different media outlets. Don't just look at one and then say, okay, that's how the country is, I'm not going there. Because it could be a great opportunity for you to play. So number one, safety is all relative to you. Number two, if you exercise basic caution and the basic principles of traveling, then you should be fine in the vast majority of countries. Number three, you have to do your own research prior to going to a country and you have to attack that research from multiple angles. Number four, whatever you come up with, take it all with a grain of salt because you're taking it from the media and you have to understand what is their objective. They're trying to make money ultimately. And number five, you have to weigh the pros and the cons and see based on everything that you just learned, would it be useful to you? So is overseas basketball safe? It depends.